Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is the second Sunday in Advent. The title of our lesson for today is Prepare the Way of the Lord. Luke chapter 3, verses, it's the candles that you smell. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, which Ananias and Caiaphas were priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. God always raises up a prophet to give the world adequate warning of his intervention in human history. Last week we listened to the very words of Jesus warning us that redemption is near. Jesus gave us all kinds of signs intended to remind us that his second coming is a reality and that we must live in such a way that makes us ready for his return. Some will remark that the church has been saying that for 2,000 years. The second coming is just a pipe dream, something the church invented to scare people into submission. Believe it or not, that's what some people really believe and say. Well, it is true the church has been anticipating the return of Christ for 2,000 years. That does not mean it's not going to happen. It just means that we are 2,000 years closer. Do not bet your eternity on skepticism. Base your eternal hope in the sure words of the Lord Jesus Christ. God always deals in certainty, never in obscurity. Notice God's precise timing indicated by Luke in his gospel. Adam Clark comments at length on the importance of the detail that appears in this gospel. He says, the facts which St. Luke mentions here tend to, excuse me, tend much to confirm the truth of the evangelical history. Christianity differs widely from philosophic system. It is founded in the goodness and authority of God and attested by historic facts. It differs also from popular tradition, which either has had no pure origin or which is lost in unknown or fabulous antiquity. It differs also from pagan and Mohammedan revelations, which were fabricated in a corner and had no witnesses. In the above verses, we find the persons, the places, and the times marked with the utmost exactness. It was under the first Caesars that the preaching of the gospel took place. And in their time, the facts on which the whole of Christianity is founded made their appearance. An age the most enlightened and the best known from the multitude of its historic records. It was in Judea where everything that professed to come from God was scrutinized with a most exact and unmerciful criticism. In writing the history of Christianity, the evangelist appealed to certain facts which were publicly transacted in such places under the government and an inspection of such and such persons and in such particular times. A thousand persons could have confronted the falsehood had it been one. These appeals are made uh, at a challenges offered to the Roman government and to the Jewish rulers and people. A new religion has been introduced in such and such a place at such a time. This has been accompanied 
with such and such facts and miracles. Who can disprove this? All are silent. None appears to offer even an objection. The cause of infidelity and irreligion is at stake. If these facts cannot be disproved, the religion of Christ must triumph. None appears because none could appear. Now let it be observed that the persons of that time only could confute these things had they been false. They never attempted it. Therefore, these facts are absolute and incontrovertible truths. This conclusion is necessary. So Adam Clark goes at length to say that uh, the truth of Christianity was revealed at this time in history. There are written records. The people actually lived. And if there had been any trickery going on, somebody back then would have addressed it. But no one did. Therefore, it is true and it must stand. Luke records that at exactly the right time in history, God sent a prophet, John, the son of Zacharias, to give warning that once again God is intervening in human history. Now, John did not go to Bible college. He did not go to seminary to learn a particular doctrine he believed the world needed to hear. John did not ruminate over the world's conditions, the Roman occupation of his homeland, or even the spiritual apathy that characterized his country's religion and then go out and preach against it. It was the word of God that came to John. This was not indigestion after eating too much pizza. It was the Holy Spirit of God moving on John with such deliberateness and certainty that John knew he had encountered the God who is there. With the supremacy of the Roman Empire in the world, God chose this man and this time to focus the world's attention on one irritating and stubborn point in the Middle East. John did not travel to Rome or to Greece to teach in the universities. John didn't even go to Jerusalem to teach in the temple or in a synagogue. Instead, the Holy Spirit directed him to go into all the region around the Jordan River, into a wilderness, into an obscure place. The Israelites had been privileged to be a unique people of God. They had this unique relationship with God in history. Instead of turning that privilege into a testimony of reclamation from sin, and acceptance with God, they turned it into a privileged, exclusive religious club that excluded everyone else. It was into this place of exclusion that God sent John with a divinely backed message the world must hear at this exact time in history. The Holy Spirit gave John the message to preach. The message was first announced to the Jews, but it was God's message intended to reach all mankind. The Holy Spirit directed John to preach a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now the Jews had the temple and sacrifices. Wasn't that good enough? Well, the problem with those sacrifices was that they could never take away sin, and the people knew it. In one sense, they really had no incentive to quit sinning. The Holy Spirit told John to require the people to repent, that is, to give up sin, or more plainly, stop sinning and relying on the useless blood of dead animals. God is willing to receive people to himself, but they must first give up 
that which separates them from God. God's commitment to salvation must be matched by the personal commitment to God on the part of the one seeking forgiveness and reconciliation with God. And the Holy Spirit also requires an outward expression of this repentance in the form of water baptism. This was a bold thing to require of the Jews, as it was an admission that the temple rites and animal sacrifices were insufficient for their salvation. You see, it made those who were baptized different from their fellow Jews, and they were loath to do that. John's coming was not an accident of nature. It was foreseen and prophesied by God through the prophet Isaiah. Luke mentions the very prophecy that Isaiah gave. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now we know that John lived his adult life in the literal wilderness. But there is a more nefarious wilderness that's intended in the scripture. And this wilderness is the wilderness of sin into which the human family was driven through the sin of Adam and Eve so long ago in the Garden of Eden. Isaiah describes the wilderness in chapter 32 of his book. For the foolish person will speak foolishness, and his heart will work iniquity. To practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also, the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans. The wilderness is the human heart filled with iniquity, practicing all manner of ungodliness and rebelling against God. The wilderness of the human heart is a perpetual condition until, as Isaiah tells us, the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The message the Holy Spirit gave John to preach was this, prepare the way of the Lord. In Advent season, we celebrate the comings of Christ. We anticipate his second coming. We rejoice in his humble birth in Bethlehem. But we must always focus our lives on the reason for his coming. Jesus is the Lord. That word Lord means supreme in authority. Christ comes to this world as the one and only supreme authority over all mankind for all time. This fact is antagonistic to the human condition because sin causes people to see themselves as gods. This is the lie fed to the human race by the serpent who told Adam and Eve that through their disobedience to the moral law of God, they themselves would be like God, knowing good and evil. The word God there in Genesis 3 is actually plural, meaning gods, and does not necessarily mean that mankind thinks itself as divinity. The word Elohim is also translated by the English word judge. So we see that the fallen human heart sets itself up as the final judge as to what it accepts to be right and wrong, good and evil, disregarding anything the true God has to say. John preached repentance. John preached, you have to change direction. Something like this, sinful mankind, 
You are going the wrong way. Turn around and go the other way. You've gotten it all wrong. He's telling the world, you must have a complete and total remake of your life. Sin has caused you to walk a crooked path that has taken you into all the rough places in your life. Can you honestly say you enjoy your self-directed life and all the things you've done that brought guilt and disappointment into your life? John says, make his paths straight. That is, get on the right road, the road of faith and righteousness as defined by God through Jesus Christ. Yes, Christ's road is a narrow way, and there are difficulties in living the way he directs you. But it is the only way that leads to peace in this life and eternity in the presence of God, our Creator. Keep going on that crooked road and that rough road that you're on, which seems to be wide and so easy for you right now, in spite of the pain that it has caused you, and you'll find that it has taken you to eternal destruction. And once you get there, you can never turn back. Today, is the day of salvation. Luke, excuse me, Luke quotes Isaiah, saying, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is actually an abridgment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5, which reads, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together from the, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. <clears throat> Repentance opens one's heart to the glory of God, which is nothing other than his divine presence. Jesus taught we must be born again. And he said this means to be born of the Spirit. In repenting sin, we give our committed sins to Jesus since he paid for them on the cross and we change the direction of our lives to follow Christ and live according to His righteousness. As we are born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, replacing the sin, and He causes us to see the Lord in ways we could never have comprehended while yet in sin. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Does this mean that all people will be saved? Are we saying that we really are universalists? No. First, all flesh can see the salvation of God as it is revealed in the Gospels. There's where it is defined. There it is where it is put on display for us to see in the Gospels. Second, and most importantly, all flesh will see the salvation of God as it is lived in the human life by those that have received it. The world needs to see salvation lived out. They need to see what it means in the lives of real flesh and blood people. People that have been in sin, but have been miraculously transformed through the new birth. The world needs to see that. Salvation isn't joining a church. It isn't even coming to church. It isn't following a bunch of rules. Salvation is the miracle of a transformed life through the new birth a life that is rescued from sin and placed on that highway of holiness, life that glorifies God, a life that tells people what the gospel is all about. To some people, the Bible is just a book with words in it. 
but when that book with words in it is lived out, it becomes a living word. And as the world can look at your example and the proof of the gospel in your lives, the Spirit of God breathes on that written word and makes it a living word so that that sin, sinner out there who is disturbed with his or her life says, well, if that person has salvation, I want that, what that person has. I see it's real because I see people that are living it. God offers the gift of salvation to all people. And in some way, all people are accountable to God for that gift, whether or not they accept it. So, you who are listening, be one that accepts this gift. God has prepared the way. As the pianist and song leader comes, we celebrate the advent of Christ, his coming. He has come and redeemed us back to God through the sacrifice of himself on the cross. Will you let Jesus Christ come into your life? Without Christ in your life, your life is on the wrong road, leading you to an eternity that you will forget, regret forever. If you make his path straight in your life, he will smooth out the rough places and straighten out that crooked road you are on. If you are here pressing, professing salvation, are you one in whom all flesh can see the salvation of God? Are you what the gospel makes a person? Or are you still acting as your own God, making up your own rules as you go? John was God's prophet that announced the advents of Christ at his first coming. John wants your life to be a prophet that prepares people for Christ's second coming and for the end of time. So let us stand and sing our closing hymn, number 173.